Do Ernest Hemingway short stories make you feel like you need to go to Spain and drink away all your troubles? If so, then you're in the right place, because today we're going to be looking at the wonderful yet strongly ambiguous short story, Hills Like White Elephants. So a lot of people, when they read this short story, ask themselves, what did I just read? And the answer, of course, is Hills Like White Elephants by Ernest Hemingway. But I understand your confusion. This is a piece that when you get to the end of it, you feel like you know less than when you started. At least that's how I felt the first time I read it. A lot of this confusion comes from the way that Hemingway sets up the story. I mean, look at this short passage of dialogue I've put on the screen. It looks more like a play than it does a short story. It's all dialogue. But if we read this dialogue carefully, we'll notice that a lot of what is unsaid can clue us into what the characters are actually thinking about, and what they're talking about is just under the surface or the subtext. Let's read this real quick. And we could have all of this, she said, and we could have everything and every day we make it more impossible. What did you say? I said we could have everything. No, we, we can't have everything. No, we can't. We can have the whole world. No, we can't. We can go everywhere. No, we can't. It isn't ours anymore. It's ours. No, it isn't. And once they take it away, you never get it back. So this piece here is uh, the American man and the girl he's with discussing something. But what you'll notice is there's a lot of pronouns, a lot of it's, but we don't necessarily know what it is. It seems to be it is the world that they're talking about, but we don't know what this world is. It's a world of vacations and booze, certainly, but there's more to it than that. And especially that last line, no, it isn't, and once they take it away, you never get it back, it feels like that pronoun could be more than just the world. In this next passage of text, I think we'll figure out what exactly the it that they're discussing so vaguely is. Okay, so in this passage, there's a real shift in conversation. I want to spend some time detailing how Hemingway sets up the conversation, but while I'm doing that, see if you can hear a shift that takes place. The beer's nice and cool, the man said. It's lovely, the girl said. It's really an awfully simple operation, Jig, the man said. It's not really an operation at all. The girl looked at the ground the table legs rested on. I know you wouldn't mind it, Jig. It's really not anything. It's just to let the air in. The girl did not say anything. I'll go with you, and I'll stay with you all the time. They just let the air in, and then it's all perfectly natural. Then what will we do afterward? We'll be fine afterward, just like we were before. What makes you think so? That's the only thing that bothers us. It's the only thing that's made us unhappy. The girl looked at the bead curtain, put her hand out, and took hold of two of the strings of beads. And you think then we'll be all right and be happy? I know we will. You don't have to be afraid. I've known lots of people that have done it. So have I, said the girl, and afterward they were all so happy. Did you notice a shift in conversation? We'll get right back to that. But first off, I want to talk about what a lot of people critique this story for and how I think it's actually a strength. What I've done here in blue is highlight where the man said something and in orange where the girl said something. And in green, we'll get to the green in a second. Notice that... All there is, is what is said. The man said. The man said. The girl said. The girl did not say anything. Said the girl. I tell my students all the time, do not use the word says or said, because it doesn't mean anything. We don't ever really say things. We argue them, or we exclaim them, or we denounce them, or... Um, celebrate them. You know, we do all sorts of things, but we don't say things. It's too vague of a word. It's not descriptive at all. So if I, as a small town English teacher, can recognize this, then don't you think one of the most influential writers in American history would? Yeah. Hemingway knows that this isn't very descriptive. So why isn't he being descriptive? Because when people talk about difficult topics, that's when they might actually just say things. They don't have as much passion in their voice, they just say them. And what really is important is what's unsaid. Just to point out the contrast here, look at what's in green. The girl looked at the bead curtain, put her hand out, and took hold of two of the strings of beads. That's a super minute detail. 
but she's not saying that detail. She's looking at it. She's listening. So we get detail of their posture and what they're drinking and all sorts of stuff, but not when they're saying anything, because the key to this story is what's unsaid. And if you couldn't figure it out from the shift in conversation, it's what we have in yellow here. It's really an awful, awfully simple operation jig. It's not really an operation at all. Everything before this is nonchalant, and then suddenly our conversation turns incredibly important, an operation. And if you couldn't kind of tell from the context clues, the operation they're discussing is an abortion. Now, there's a couple of reasons why people are sometimes shocked to hear that they're discussing an abortion, and we'll get to that in a little bit. But um, that's what it is. That's what's unsaid. And what Hemingway did is he wrote a story about two people discussing whether or not to have an abortion without using the word abortion. I think that's really clever because when we discuss things that are really difficult and really kind of um, gnawing at our core, we do two things. One, we don't often say them right away. We make small talk, which happens in this story, everything before this section of the text. And two, we kind of beat around the bush. We use euphemisms. We use pronouns instead of the actual word. And that's certainly the case in this story. So why are people sometimes confused that it's an abortion? Well, part of that is the details. There's a lot of drinking that goes on in this story. Look at this section here. I don't want you to do anything that you don't want to do, nor that isn't good for me, she said. I know. Could we have another beer? All right, but you've got to realize, I realize, the girl said. Can't we maybe stop talking? So instead of discussing whether or not to actually have this abortion, they basically drink away their sorrows, which again, we feel like, well, pregnant women don't drink. Well, this one does. And I think what that line, that third line, all right, but you've got to realize that it might be bad for the unborn child is cut off by the girl who says, I realize. So here we have all this conflict. Um, this child is in the way of their vacationing lifestyle, but they can't agree whether or not to have an abortion. And there's a, a really interesting dynamic between these characters that I want to explore a little bit further here. So there's three characters in this story for the most part. I want to see if you can identify them. Okay, you probably got the man and you probably got the girl because even if you didn't read this story and you're just watching this video to try and get away, you know, without doing your homework, which... By the way, you could have read the story by now. I'm eight minutes in. This is a super short, <laughs> short story. Do you know the third character? I'll give you a second to think about it. Did you get the woman? You're like, whoa, who's this woman? Well, the woman is the woman who is serving the beer to the man, the American man and the girl. That's all they're ever called. The woman is a different character and she's serving the beer. Why is she there? Is it just to bring alcohol? I don't think so. I think there's more at play, and that has to do with the setting. Where does the story take place? Spain. Absolutely. Why? Do they just have particularly white elephant-like hills in Spain? I don't think so. See, the key to understanding this dynamic is that the man speaks Spanish. The girl does not. And the woman constantly says phrases where the girl says, what did she say? And the man has to translate for her. For her. So what you're getting in this story is a girl looking for guidance in a land where she doesn't even speak the language. And the man is able to give her guidance with things like the train schedule and the alcohol menu and what the waitress is saying, but he's not giving any guidance on the abortion. It seems like he wants her to have it, but only if she wants to have it. He's really not saying anything. He's not taking any position. He's not really discussing anything in detail and that's why we get to a point where the girl finally says could you please 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 stop talking because he never really starts talking he talks a lot in this story but he never he never really gets to the substance of anything so let's talk about that ending real quick okay so do we have a conclusion i don't know our story ends with do you feel better he asked i feel fine she said there's nothing wrong with me. I feel fine. 
And as I pointed out here, the story ends in the same sort of bland, non-descriptive writing it started with. These characters, they have flat character arcs. They go nowhere. So it's an ending of stasis rather than resolution. And I think we feel like this is unliterary or unfictional. We love our stories to have resolutions, even if they're bad resolutions, but it's not unrealistic. There's a lot of conversations that are full of missing words or things that go unsaid and are never fully addressed. And um, that's a lot like life. And in that sense, I think Hemingway wrote life as it was, and he, he did that very well in this story. So one final thing, what about that title? The girl, of course, says the hills look like white elephants, and it's the title of our story. So why did Hemingway make the hills look like white elephants? Why that detail? Well, two reasons. One, the elephant in the room. And of course, the elephant in the room is the abortion, something in the room that no one will acknowledge. Even though it's huge, like an elephant, but everyone ignores it, that would be the unsaid word of the story. And why is this elephant in the room a white elephant, you ask? That's an unusual color. Well, in some countries, we do things at Christmas or other gift-giving occasions called white elephant exchanges, which is where you give someone an unwanted gift or a gift you didn't want anymore, you white elephant to someone else. And of course, the, the child, the unborn child, is an unwanted gift, so to speak. So that kind of dual nature makes for a really clever image and uh, also helps clue us into what exactly the story might be about. So thank you so much for watching. Sorry that I kept hitting my mouse and showing the number of slides down in the uh, bottom left corner. But hey, that's just like, you know, uh, a good way to see, you know, um, how much more there is to go, so to speak. I guess they show you the time on these videos, don't they? Anyway, it's very late, so I'm going to stop talking. Thank you so much for watching. Feel free to like, subscribe, ask me any questions in the comments if you have some, and maybe check out some of these other videos. And uh, have a good one. Bye.